So I'm going to talk to you about how we can further our understanding of disability in a humanitarian context. So before we begin, a little bit about myself. Hi, I'm Gagan Narula. I'm 33 years old and an Indian national. I live in Zurich, Switzerland, where I work at the University Hospital Zurich. I do advanced machine learning for biomedical science. And I did my PhD at the ETH Zurich about how birds learn from each other. So if anybody's interested in social learning, come talk to me later. Uh, so let's get down to it. I am the Statistics for Disability Fellow. Why are we interested in studying disability data? Well, disability has become a global priority in the humanitarian community, as evidenced by the signing of the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disability in 2007, ratified by 177 countries, and now disability is a core focus of the Sustainable Development Goals. As part of this project, we are trying to get a deeper understanding into the barriers faced by and the lives of people living with disability, especially in a humanitarian setting. The approach, uh, before we go into the details, first we have to have a definition of uh, disability. And the International Classification on Functioning, Disability and Health provides us just that. It defines disability as something that arises from an interaction between a person's difficulties functioning, for example, difficulty seeing or walking, and the barriers faced in the environment, such as psychosocial barriers, institutional barriers, and physical barriers. The interaction of these then generates disability. My approach to understanding the problem was to first talk to a lot of people in the disability data community, try to understand how they collect, analyze, and advocate for disability, try to understand the problem space and the needs. And then I analyzed two microdata data sets focused on disability. For the sake of time, I'm only going to show you results from the first of these two data sets, which was on Syrian refugees who are living in camps in Jordan and Lebanon. Of all the analysis that I did, I'm going to share with you uh, findings from two key topics. The first one is about how do functional difficulties, as measured by a certain instrument called the Washington, Washington Group of Questions, relates to barriers in the environment. And this goes towards the interaction part of the definition of disability. And the second question is, how do we decide who is a person with disability? But this goes towards the generation of disability part of the definition. So let's start with the first question. How do functional difficulties relate to barriers in the environment? To do this, I looked at correlation analysis as a technique and mutual information as a measure. I know this is really technical, but essentially mutual information is a way to measure statistical dependence between variables. If two variables are statistically independent, mutual information is zero. If they start getting more and more dependent, mutual information rises. OK, let's look at the data now. So I'm showing you a subset of the data, and it looks funny. It's a graph. Each circle here is a question asked as part of the survey. And each link exists if there is some mutual information between these questions. And um, because of simplicity, I'm only showing you questions related to assistance on cash. And then there are questions in green related to the Washington Group questions, which are on functional difficulties. There's also a blue node showing prevalence of disability, and then these red circles are about age and gender and employment. What we find is, for example, that there are a lot of correlations between the availability of cash services and the mental health, anxiety, and depression in the population, which is kind of understandable. But also, correlation analysis can help us understand things like this guy here. So these two questions are, Safety fears for movement when attack, harassment, or arrested are considered, or safety fears for movement when harm or injuries are considered. Now, this turns out to be a question that's repeated in a number of other domains, for example, medical services, or shelter, or water. And in each case, these questions turn out to be correlated. So in this case, you could think, well, these questions are highly similar. So the correlation really means that people find it hard to distinguish these two questions which means that a person who is designing the survey can merge these questions into one. This helps because this will help shorten the questionnaire, which is essential in a humanitarian setting. When you look at the part of the data set that targeted minors, there are two categories of questions, one on child functioning, which is kind of the equivalent of the Washington group for children, and then questions on education. And here you see very interesting correlation structure between, within each category. But I'd like to focus on certain questions on education, which act as bridges of information between these two categories. 
And these two questions are, for example, how many years of education did the child miss? What is the current education status of the child? And by looking at correlations in this way, we can start thinking about what are the perhaps causal relationships between child functioning and education. So that's what I wanted to say about the relationship between functional difficulties and the barriers in the environment. What about the second part? How do we decide who is a person with disability? To answer this question, we have to kind of reframe the question. That's because, in general, everyone agrees that disability is a continuum. However, for reasons of response planning and targeting vulnerable populations, you kind of have to have a cutoff. The Washington Group questions can be used to get a cutoff and decide who is a person with disability. However, the Washington Group questions are only about functioning difficulties. They don't take the environment into context. So is there a way we can visualize the spectrumness of disability while also taking the environmental barriers into account and then use this to estimate the utility of a chosen cutoff? So imagine, this is now for illustrative purposes, that you can take people as a profile, each person that answers all these questions about Washington Group and barriers in the environment, and take this high dimensional representation of a person and bring it down to only one axis. And then I label these histograms of people by people who have a disability and who don't, based on a cutoff that was chosen in this survey. Now, if the cutoff leads to such a distribution where the two populations completely overlap, well, that means the cutoff doesn't really work because it doesn't separate people with from people without. However, if you start seeing some separation with some overlap, then yes, disability is a spectrum, but the cutoff helps in deciding who is more vulnerable and who has to be targeted first. And in the extremely unlikely case that the two distributions are extremely apart, um, we could say that disability can be binarized. You can find a cutoff that clearly separates those with and those without disability. To do this, I take the data and I do something called principal component analysis and linear discriminant analysis. I won't go into the details, you can ask me later, which brings this high dimensional profile of a person down to this one axis. And what we find is when the threshold that was applied in the survey is used, in this case the threshold is if a person reports a lot of difficulty on any of the Washington group domains, like difficulty seeing for example, then they are considered a person with disability. And you find the situation that was shown in the middle on the last slide, that there is some amount of overlap between the people with disability and without. That's good, that's expected. But there is some skewness to the distribution. So you could consider, if you want to target people, that you would want to walk from this side of the axis inwards, and that would be a vulnerability scale, which could help people, uh, humanitarian communities target people properly. If you change the threshold to something like some difficulty in more than two domains, there is still some amount of separation, but then the two curves start separating. So this is an avenue for further analysis. What kind of cutoff gives you best separation while not changing the disability percentage too much? That's all I have in terms of analysis. Going forward, I have some recommendations for the center. First of all, they need to work with the humanitarian community involved in disability data collection because these results cannot generalize if everybody asks different questions. So you need to standardize the surveys. That's number one. Number two, the methodologies need to be better reported because that was one of the pain points for me was trying to figure out exactly how people came up with these disability prevalences. For country offices and data providers, I suggest that you do use the Washington group questions. As we saw, even though they're about functional difficulty, they still separate people with and without disability even when you take the environment into context. You need to enrich data sets by combining it with administrative data because these surveys are about people's perceptions and they do not reflect what is actually available in the surrounding where the people live, for example, services and infrastructure, etc. To survey designers, you can use these correlation analysis methods to decide where you can merge questions or where you can focus and build causal models. And finally, to all actors involved in disability, please do responsibly share your data hopefully on HDX. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that without more data and more comprehensive data, building models and analysis are going, not going to result in anything useful because you can't build robust and generalizable models. Thank you, that's all for me today.